So this is the 55th Pain Journal Club of the season two. And uh, we are going to discuss a very interesting topic today. Uh, so just allow me to share the screen. Uh, so I hope you all can see my screen now. Guys, please type yes in the chat box if you can. I'll just make it full screen as well. Please type yes in the chat box if you can see my screen. Come on, guys, I need some response. I need at least 10 yeses before we go. Yes, thank you, Dr. Anchal. Thank you, Dr. Taruna, Dr. Maitri, Dr. Chandran. Yes. Only five, five of you typing, guys. Come on. Yeah, great. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kritika, Dr. Santana, Dr. Padmaja. Okay. So let's start, guys. Uh, so today the theme is uh, percutaneous chordotomy, and uh, it's a very interesting topic. And also the SPN guidelines for cancer pain. Last two uh, weeks, we have covered the ISSP cancer pain guidelines uh, extensively. And now we're going to see the ASPN guidelines for cancer pain. And we are very fortunate to have some stalwarts in uh, pain medicine uh, and palliative care as our faculties today. Uh, so let's begin. So before we start, uh, as customary introduction, uh, pain medicine world over has got diverse issues, variable standards, different learning requirements, different offerings. Time and money are the key constraints which uh, prevent uh, the uh, pain physicians from uh, getting this information to increase their knowledge. So to overcome this, uh, Panesha Spine Wellness and Pain Relief Center has come up with Mumbai Pain School, wherein we are using uh, online platforms like Facebook, like Instagram, like Twitter to overcome these issues of time as well as money. We are uh, uh, bringing in online learning which most of our content is on demand uh, we are uh, having both free and paid content with hands-on workshops we're very fortunate to have expert faculties from all over the world it is said that the best teachers they teach from the heart and not from the book and uh, journal club is nothing it's just a club the only difference is that we critically evaluate the recent academic literature which is based on a defined uh, subject uh, attendee participation is extremely important, so I request uh, all of you to just freely express yourselves through chat or raise your hands, I can unmute you as well. Uh, you can uh, ask questions, comments, give suggestions uh, as well. So guys, for the journal club, it's very tough to be regular. So uh, I request you all to be try to be regular so that you can learn every week. Uh, even Harrison had his own journal club, he used to conduct it twice uh, a month and the purpose was critical evaluation of the academic literature. Uh, time and discipline is important, so I request both the speakers to please stick to their timelines. Uh, healthy skepticism or praise is most appreciated, so all the attendees are requested to uh, uh, participate. This is a bit about me. Uh, I am uh, a pain physician practicing exclusive pain since the last eight years in Mumbai. Uh, and today we have with us uh, Dr. Professor R.P. Gedu, sir. Uh, just let me check and promote him to panelist. I saw him, he was in quite early, I think much before me. So yes, I can see, sir. Sir, I have promoted you to panelist. And also you can allow, you can now, I think, talk. Just, yes. So welcome, uh, Dr. Professor R. P. Gedu, sir. So he's a, a DA, MD, FICA, FIAPM. Uh, um, I think one of the most renowned figures in uh, anesthesiology as well as in pain uh, in uh, this part of the world. He's uh, served as a professor in anesthesia and Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, for quite a long time, probably almost my lifetime. Uh, then he served as a professor of anesthesia in D.Y. Patil Medical College in Navi Mumbai. He's currently serving there. He's a recognized PG teacher for MD and D examinations. 
he is an examiner and paper setter for md dad and b and pcc pen exams almost uh, 128 times even more than that probably uh, he has about uh, over 400 presentations and 58 live demonstrations of nerve block workshops in different international national and state conferences he has been the editor for nine pen books and 28 chapters in different books he has been an international faculty for different countries which include uh, different cities also uh, which include Be- beirut cairo dhaka uh, bangkok uh, sri lanka cambodia uh, he has been the past president of indian society for study of pain and former chairman for iapm course uh, he has been the member of editorial boards for indian journal of anesthesia and indian journal of pain he has lots and lots of other things which i could not put in the cv and that doesn't do justice to what achievements he has so welcome you sir Uh, so now I will introduce the second uh, faculty, uh, Doctor Professor Shush- uh, Sushma Bhatnagar. She is uh, uh, one of the most uh, decorated persons uh, and uh, uh, also uh, one of the most popular uh, uh, anesthesiologists, pain physician, palliative care physicians across the globe. Uh, she is currently the professor and head of Department of Onco Anesthesia, Pain and Palliative Medicine at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, in India, which is. one of the uh, best uh, hospitals in the world uh, she is the president of indian association of palliative care she is a um, uh, counselor isp uh, completing her term this year and for the last 5 years she has been uh, the counselor uh, she is uh, on the board of directors of national association of hospice and palliative care she has been the former chief editor of indian journal of palliative care she is a recipient of various awards some of them being award of excellence in palliative medicine among sar countries and uh, uh, also the susan raj uh, uh, pain physician of the year 20, 2012 2013 awards for her as well uh, you know this slide doesn't do uh, much justice uh, this is just the information which i could gather and uh, there is much more to her um, as well uh, so welcome you ma'am i just will just try to search for her let's see okay so we also have now we'll move on to uh, our speakers i think we'll start with the uh, uh, dr namrata dr namrata i have uh, promoted you to the role of the panelist and now i'll also make you the uh, the co-host so please uh, you can now start sharing your uh, screen i think i'll just make you the co-host Yes, so I think you can start sharing your screen. I'll stop my share now, and uh, uh, let us begin. Yes, I can see you. Yes. Uh, should I start sharing my screen? Yeah, sure, sure. Is it visible? Yes. so uh, i am dr namrata bhagwat i will be presenting uh, well let me yeah. introduce yourself can you put on the slide just a okay yeah so dr namrata bhagwat is md in anesthesiology fellowship in pain diploma in nutrition and fitness she is working as a consultant pain physician at the watsal pain clinic watsal hospital as well as santukaram hospital nakola and she has also done her uh, uh, qualification in nutrition so is she is also working as a fitness and nutrition coach so welcome dr namrata you may start your presentation thank you uh this is an article on percutaneous cordotomy for pain palliation in advanced cancer it is a randomized clinical trial study protocol the protocol is for undertaking a single institution double blind sham controlled trial uh, published in august 2020 in the journal of neurosurgery conduct will be conducted by vishwanathan et al the study will be conducted at the department of neurosurgery uh, baylor college of medicine houston texas so uh, the introduction is like why we Uh, picked up this article because we wanted to find articles relating to effect of cordotomy on refractory cancer pain 
and these um, this study was proposed to find out a definitive evidence to support the use of ablative procedures such as corotomy for patients with medically refractory cancer pain ideally pain in advanced cancer should be ameliorated yet despite multimodal palliative pain treatments it still remains one of the most common symptoms in advanced cancer corotomy is a promising procedure wherein a spinal cord pain pathway is interrupted in a minimally invasive way in patients with unilateral arm leg or chest wall pain due to cancer advances in intraop imaging and ability to use real time ct guidance has made corotomy safer more effective and less invasive but a question needs to be addressed whether corotomy can improve pain outcomes in optimally treated patients with refractory cancer pain so that's why they proposed the study the study goals and objectives are primary objective 1 secondary objective 2 and secondary objective 3 the primary is assess the efficacy of corotomy for patients with unilateral advanced cancer pain the hypothesis which they have put forward is corotomy is effective against cancer pain end point is reduction in pain intensity and end point 2 will be provide initial estimates of the magnitude of effect of corotomy secondary objective define the patient experience of corotomy for cancer pain refractory to palliative care the hypothesis is that corotomy aligns well with the patient goals towards the end of life so they will be doing this through interview with the patients and comparing the experience third objective determine whether mri can be used as non invasive biomarker for successful corotomy post the hypothesis is post procedure mri can successfully determine whether a successful corotomy has been performed they will compare the mean diffusivity between responders and non responders methods study design it's a randomized controlled double blind parallel group trial comparing percutaneous corotomy with a control intervention for patients with advanced cancer pain that is refractory to interdisciplinary palliative care rather than comparing corotomy against a pure sham corotomy they compare corotomy against an intrathecal morphine injection which can be performed in a blinded manner during the sham corotomy the baseline assessment demographic variables various questionnaires patients opioid and non opioid medication regimen will be recorded and the morphine equivalent daily dosage will be calculated randomization protocol will be conducted and interventional procedures will be undertaken this is the protocol which they have designed so patients with advanced cancer pain refractory to palliative care once they are uh, once they are in, included as per the criteria the baseline assessment and randomization will be done the allocation to various groups will be done whether corotomy has to be done or control intervention and then follow up and assessment will be undertaken so post op day 1 MRI will be done to confirm whether a successfully successful corotomy has been done. Post op day seven, um, the Edmonton scale, the uh, pain inventory, uh, all these will be given as in, uh, questionnaires. And post op day fourteen, there will be a qualitative interview, sensory testing, and outcomes. The monthly assessment is there uh, for six months, and then the analysis will be done. These are the inclusion criteria, and these are the exclusion criteria. Procedure will be. Uh, so for the corotomy group patient will be in lateral position uh, 5 cc of intrathecal contrast is administered a trendlenburg position will be given uh, once the cord is visible uh, the patient will be taken to ct scan suite and uh, the corotomy needle will be inserted into the lateral spinothalamic tract uh, taking care that and relevant stimulations will be done so that there is no motor stimulation and no stimulation of corticospinal tract and the required rf will be done in control intervention a lumbar puncture will be done but there is no injection of contrast there is just 0.3 mg morphine injected which is the standard of care and a 20 gauge spinal needle will be put, uh, just put outside the dura so the dura will not be breached and an rf needle will be placed through it to simulate a corotomy but a corotomy will not be done so when it comes to secondary objective assessment patients will be interviewed uh, when they will return to the clinic approximately 2 weeks after the procedure the theory applied is story theory as whatever the patient tells will reveal what matters most to them patient interviews qualitative analysis will remain blinded to the intervention group this is the questionnaire which will be provided to the patient follow up the patient will be seen as an inpatient on the day after the procedure and patients will undergo a telephonic consultation at one week point to obtain their scores 
on post procedure day 1 patient will undergo an mri of the cervical spine with and without contrast including diffusion that is the tau inversion the uh, these are the software packages which will be used for analysis and the size and configuration of the lesions will be calculated current who guidelines for management of cancer pain do not include interventional pain strategies aim of this study is to provide a definitive evidence to support the use of polytomy for patients with advanced cancer and refractory unilateral pain due to that cancer the ultimate goal is establishing evidence based guidelines for the use of interventional strategies for palliative care during polytomy the patient cannot perceive when the spinal cord lesion is created and therefore it this is an ideal uh, study for sham control procedure principal investigator has a uh, good credential has uh, has done a series of polytomy he supported by senior investigators who have experience in this the trial status is open for open for recruitment safety consideration is that since polytomy is not a standard of uh, care procedure there are no ethical concerns of withholding it from the sham control group that group will continue to receive the standard of care which is the interdisciplinary palliative care data analysis for each objective will be done and will be compared to the sham control group the quality assurance is in place this is the assessment costs and durations the cost of polytomy will be funded by the patient's insurance cost of control intervention will be covered by the study budget billing will be delayed by 1 month after the procedure to help maintain the blind duration june 1st 2019 to feb 28 2024 trial will be stopped if the absolute nominal critical point is larger than 2.782 to claim that the polytomy treatment is better that is early success or worse utility than the sham intervention group critical analysis the trial is on yet to conclude to derive any conclusions polytomy is not a routine procedure can be considered as a last resort in severe pain refractory treatment requires a lot of follow up subject to response from patients to the calls cost effectiveness can be a challenge in a few settings the take home message is there is a need of an evidence based procedure to relieve the pain in advanced cancer refractory to established standard of care more and more studies are needed in this direction thank you thank you uh, dr namrata for the excellent presentation uh, so i now request uh, um, I think Dr. Akhil can share his uh, presentation, and then we can discuss. Or uh, Giru sir, do you like to say something, or we can take both the questions at the end. Whatever you say, sir. I think we can take it at the end. Let Akhil present. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, Dr. Akhil, you can start with your presentation. Yes, we can see your slides. So. Yes. So let me introduce Dr. Akhil. Dr. Akhil Bhalla is a MD in anesthesiology, and he has done his uh, fellowship in pain medicine. Uh, and he is uh, currently working as assistant professor in the department of uh, anesthesia and pain management, uh, and also as um, in charge of the pain and palliative care at Adesh Medical College in Ambala. He is a founder and consultant of uh, Painacle Advanced Pain Management. So welcome, Dr. Akhil. Over to you. thank you so much sir uh, good evening everybody so the article which i'll be discussing so the article which i'll be discussing today is the american society of pain and neuroscience aspn best practices and guidelines for the interventional management of cancer associated pain so this was a best practices and guideline which were given uh, by mansoor aman Uh, memo that all in the journal of pain research 2021 so 55% of the patients with cancer report with significant pain uh, which includes the anti cancer treatment including radiation chemotherapy and hormonal therapy even after cancer survival the cancer survivors around 20 to 50% of survivors continue to experience pain and functional limitations over the coming years So in 2017, WHO had provided clinical guidelines for the opioid administration. Also, EAPC had given guidelines which specifically address the use of opioids, including uh, to be used for breakthrough pain for the treatment of cancer pain. But interventional pains, which have been 
uh, quite effective in providing pain relief and reducing the burden of symptoms and minimize the opioid intake and also have a low complication rate. But there was no guidelines which addressed the interventional treatments and uh, were as a bridge for the um, conservative up to the surgical guidelines. So they were these best practice, practice guidelines which were made to offer evidence-based recommendation for utilizing advanced interventional therapies for cancer-related pain. So coming to the methodology, a multidisciplinary panel of pain medicine specialists was selected. A systematic review was conducted, which was uh, of the interventions which were offered by the pain physicians for cancer pain specifically. A meta-analysis could not be conducted due to the high heterogeneity in the study type. And the researches were completed using OVID Medline and Base and Cochrane Review Database. So in the PRISMA diagram, around 10 lakh uh, studies were identified out of which after removing duplicate studies, around 8,000 studies, which reflected results, which included cancer pain plus pain, pain management or analgesia in cancer pain. And uh, out of which 738 were excluded as they were non-English studies. Out of the eligibility criteria, the exclusion criteria being uh, studies which included opioids only as pain relief, acute post-operative pain in cancer pain patients, and a single patient case report was also excluded. So after excluding at least 13 studies out of the 89, which was selected for the inclusion criteria, around 76 made it to the uh, systematic review. So the level of evidence was taken as level one to three, as we all know, and uh, the United States Preventive Service Task Force grading was used as a degree of recommendation uh, for the best practices and guidelines. So coming to the data evaluation. So all of these studies, uh, so this study uh, evaluated all of the studies and gave uh, documented uh, best practices and guidelines for every topic. We'll go topic wise. So the first being opioids for cancer pain. So as we all know, WHO three-step ladder is used for the treatment of cancer pain, which recommends non-opioids being used first, followed by mild opioids and lastly by strong opioids. Adjuvant medications may be initiated at any step in the treatment process. The opioid agent selection should be individualized to the account of variance in the pain presentation and coexisting medical comorbidity. In advanced CKD or an end-stage renal disease, morphine and codeine should be avoided. Method, methadone and fentanyl appear to be safer to use in such patients. In patients with liver dysfunction, methadone, meperidine, and codeine should be avoided. Dose adjustments may be required for morphine, tramadol, oxycodone, and hydromorphone. So long-acting opioids are known to have uh, immunosuppressant properties, which is very common with morphine and fentanyl. And uh, therefore, they have increased incidence of infections also. Opioids with uh, without any immunosuppressive uh, properties have lesser infection rates such as tramadol and oxycodone and oxymorphone. Uh, codeine, fentanyl, methadone and morphine are opioids which are listed in the WHO essential drug list. So they are easily accessible. Whereas newer opioids such as buprenorphine are rather not as easily accessible as all of these four. So many patients on opioids have adverse effects. Around 10 to 20 percent of cancer pain patients receiving opioid therapy may need to change their treatment due to the severity of these adverse effects. The most common being constipation, nausea, and vomiting. There are many other side effects which might occur. Most of most common or life-threatening could be respiratory depression, sedation, urinary retention, etc. Also, there is a dependence of these drugs leading to uh, mental or physical dependence, leading to risk of withdrawal in such patients, along with hyperalgesia and hypogonadism, etc. So the best practices statement which they gave was. Uh, that opioid should be considered for moderate to severe cancer-related pain. This was a level one recommendation. And opioid agent selection should be individualized to the account of variance in the pain presentations of these patients and coexisting morbidity. This was a level three of it. Now coming to adjunct medications, methadone being the first. Methadone is a racemic mixture of two enantiomers and uh, it treats pain with both the components that is nociceptive as well as neuropathic. Uh, it has a higher intrinsic activity, but a low affinity to the mu receptor than morphine. Therefore, the pain relief is there with a minimal side effect than morphine. So it is used when patients develop opioid tolerance and are intolerant to side effects or allergic reactions to other strong opioids such as morphine. And uh, they are comparatively safe to be used in CKD and ESRD patients as they are excreted through the feces. 
So again, it has dual nociceptive neuropathic property. We start with an initial dose of 2.5 mg TDS in an opioid naive patient, and uh, with a dose adjustment of around 5 mg per day uh, after every uh, after a week. The analgesic half life is around six to eight hours, so the dosing uh, recommended is every six hourly or eight hours. Most common side effects being nausea, constipation, somnolence. There are many other rare side effects which are not so common. So the recommendations given for methadone was that methadone should be considered when other opioids are ineffective or an additional NMDA or a serotonin receptor modulator is desired. This was level two evidence. So the dosing initiated is dependent on the opioid tolerance. With the low introductory doses for naive patients, opioid naive patients. This was a level two evidence. And again, for opioid tolerant patients, a conservative approach is recommended, starting with a lesser dose, that is seven to seventy-five to ninety percent lesser dose than the cal calculated equinalgesic dose, using around one is to fifteen or one is to twenty conversion batch. This again was a level two evidence. <coughs> Now coming to ketamine. Ketamine is a non-competitive, non-competitive NMD receptor antagonist. And uh, it activates the mu delta and kappa receptors and is not reversible, uh, reliably reversed with naloxone. Uh, again, IV or oral ketamine is used for refractory pain, which is not responding to other analgesics or adjuvants. It may also be considered with patients having central sensitization for the palliative treatment for any neuropathic pain in such patients. But there is again absence of any conclusive evidence. As the data remain, uh, data used only for cancer patients specifically is mixed, and there was not any high quality data present. So the uh, recommendation given was a level two, stating that uh, ketamine therapy for cancer pain should be considered on a case by case basis for refractory neuropathic pain, bone pain, or mucositis related pain in cancer pain patients. Coming to radiotherapy, radioisotopes. Uh, the most common site of metastasis in uh, cancer pain patients is spine and sacrum. Uh, EBRT or external beam radiation therapy, most commonly being used, is uh, eight gray with a single treatment fraction, and uh, this is said to provide equivalent pain relief as compared to the conventional 30 gray, which you used to be delivered in 10 treatment fractions. And the most commonly used isotopes are samarium, strontium, and radium. Uh, radium is usually reserved for patients having multifocal disease. With castration restraint, prostate cancer. Again, denosumab and bisphosphonates are used for painful metastatic diseases. Uh, their mechanism of action being they inhibit the osteoclastic uh, bone resorption and potentially reducing the risk of any bone fracture or related bony e pain. So the recommendations were that EBRT with a short fractionated regimen uh, over a conventional uh, protracted schedule for painful metastatic bone disease. Uh, is followed. A uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy may be preferred for radio-resistant cancer or oligometastatic disease. This was the level one evidence. So there is also evidence of use of osteoclastic inhibitors, also uh, although it has not been found to be effective for some cancers such as metastatic small, uh, non-small cell uh, lung cancer. Therefore, these agents should be used as an adjuvant and considered on a case by case basis. This was the level two evidence. Now coming to bone uh, blocks and neuralizers. Um, sympathetic blocks and neuralizers are used for intractable visceral cancer-related pain. Uh, so a diagnostic block is uh, likely helpful to identify any pain generators which there would be and differentiate between vis visceral versus somatic original pain. Uh, Celiac plexus uh, supplies the upper abdominal structure. The superior hypogastric plexus supplies the lower abdominal and the pelvic structure, whereas the ganglion impar supplies the Perineum, the rectum, anus, uh, vulva, urethra, and the vagina. Uh, celiac plexus. Um, the most common approaches for celiac plexus neuralysis are transaortic, as it was mentioned in the run, entry, uh, anti-crural, retrocrural, flank neck, etc. And it is even performed by gastroenterologists via an anterior endoscopic approach. Very recently, it has been started being used by an ultrasound via an anterior percutaneous approach. Celiac plexus supplies the efferent sympathetic tone to the GI tract. The blockade results in temporary orthostatic hypotension and diarrhea, which is explained to the patient privately uh, due to unopposed parasympathetic action. So, an RCT done by Emmer et al. found that patients who were randomized to celiac plexus neuralysis before step two on the WHO ladder had better pain control and quality of life compared to those who were randomized to the neuralysis. And had failed to achieve an analgesia after step three on the ladder. 
So the most common agent which is used is dehydrated alcohol, ranging from around 15 to 50 ml. Even the most common which they have found having good pain relief was around 40 ml of around 50 to 100 percent alcohol. So superior hypoglastic uh, hypogastric plexus block uh, neurolysis was first described by Plancart et al. with a classic technique uh, with a fluoroscopy guided bilateral needle insertion at the level of L5 and S1. Uh, there are many studies which have seen that there is a greater than 50% reduction in vascoles and opioid consumption that persists at two, in, two to three months respectively uh, as compared to the intervention group compared to the opioid only group. But there is a lack of large prospective randomized control trials for such patients. Ganglion, ganglion impar block was again first described by Plancarte et al. in 1990, but it was used to treat sympathetic pain of malignant origin and the approach followed was enococcygeal. Nowadays, the most commonly used approach is the percutaneous transcoccygeal approach with a fluoroscopic guidance, as it provides a shorter needle path and a more direct approach. There are many complications which could occur, such as motor, sexual, uh, border, uh, bowel, bowel or bladder dysfunction and perforation of the rectum. So coming to the recommendations, the celiac plexus neurolysis should be performed for pancreatic cancer related moderate to severe abdominal pain which is refractory to energetic level 1 evidence. Splanchnic neurolysis should be considered in patients with intractable cancer related abdominal pain due to advanced body and tail located pancreatic cancer. Again level 1 evidence. Level 2 evidence for early neurolysis is associated with better outcomes as already discussed. Level 2 evidence for superior hypogastric block neurolysis to be considered in patients with intractable pelvic cancer related pain. And a level 3 evidence for ganglion impar neurolysis to be considered in uh, intractable perineal cancer related pain. Coming to epidural and intrathecal analysia. Severe cancer pain despite adequate trials of conventional medication uh, is when it is indicated or when dose limiting side effects are present. So the pharmacokinetic being it is a targeted drug therapy which leads to elimination or reduction of the oral opioid along with dramatic reductions in the serum opioid level which is to be achieved. The most common variables in determining the kinetics and dispersion of an opioid within the CSF and the intrathecal space would be the catheter location, the injected velocity, the cardiac cycle variables and the properties of the opioid. So trial procedure in a cancer pain patient uh, it is highly controversial and have questionable utility. So trialing is told to be optional. So there are many disadvantages of a trialing therapy. The, um, it can be said that it, uh, patients have a limited life expectancy, so it is not to be followed. Many cancer patients are on anticoagulants. The uh, trialing requires an additional discontinuation of the therapy, which can lead to increased risk of uh, thromboembolic events, additional costs, additional risk of the trial and many other things. Advantages would be uh, payer authorization can be uh, achieved, access of tolerability of this patient would be achieved and assessment of efficacy in a reluctant patient can be done. So managing chronic opioid therapy in the setting of a trial procedure. So again, uh, for a non-malignant or a non-cancer pain patient, um, a trial procedure can be uh, used, but in a cancer pain patient, it is impractical and unethical to withhold the analgesics prior to initiating any intrathecal drug therapy. So recent studies uh, have studied that it is uh, there is an ability to safely and effectively discontinue opioid, systemic opioids in the perioperative period and in the transition, which is exclusively to the intrathecal drug therapy. So implant considerations, um, there are two kinds of implants which are usually uh, used. Peristaltic continuous pump, that is the Synchromed 2 pump by Medtronic and wall gated pumps by Prometra, uh, Flonex Medical. Uh, the continuous pumps use, uh, use a roller uh, geared rotor system which deliver the medications by peristaltic sequence into the intrathecal catheter. The pressurized gases around the metal bellows which are present exert pressure on the, uh, in, uh, on the reservoir present inside which contains the medication and changing the volume depends on the volume of the drug present inside. The wall gated pumps, there is a precision dosing system which is not susceptible to external factors like pressure or temperature and there is a reduced granuloma, gran, granuloma formation with wall gated pumps which prevents corrosion with combination therapy within the reservoir. Intrathecal medications, uh, three approved uh, drugs by the FDA 
uh, can be used intrathecally, which is morphine, zinconide, and baclofen. Off-label drugs can be tried, and uh, after FDA-approved drugs are attempted and have failed or are contraindicated, such as fentanyl, sufentanyl, hydromorphone, bupivacaine, and clonidine. So these are the various catheter type locations which are used where the pain is located and uh, uh, the vertebral body catheter type location in case of EIDD. So the total daily dose of the intrathecal medication was uh, chalked out. Uh, Stint et al. Uh, suggested an initial daily intrathecal dose following implantation to be calculated using a ratio of 100 is to 1 for the patient's daily oral morphine equivalent dose prior to the implant, assuming all systemic opioids are discontinued. If an intrathecal trial was performed, the PACC guidelines recommend that the daily initiating intrathecal dose be 50% or less of the successful trial dose, if at all the trialing was done, with the demand dosages of 5 to 20% of the total trial daily dose. So there are other factors also which could be a risk of cardiopulmonary depression and whether the patient will be admitted to the hospital for observation. Based on clinical experience, the author said that a conversion of 10 is to 1 can be considered for an epidural trial for intrathecal dosing. So the complications with an intrathecal drug delivery system would be cardiopulmonary depression being the most common, anaphylaxis being the most common, and meningitis being quite common. There are many rare and potential complications which could be even uh, deadly, that is uh, a granuloma formation at the catheter tip, bleeding complications, infection risk, and complications related to surgery management, and many others such as meningitis, headaches, hygroma, uh, hyperalgesia, hypertension, etc. The annual rate for the complication which do require surgical intervention is around 10%, with a good chunk of it being the catheter-related, catheter that is 65%, and pump-related being around 35%. So, cancer-specific. Uh, cancer pain specific considerations for the intrathecal uh, drug dosing. Uh, there have been sub reports of uh, battery drain or electric failure if the pump is directly in the range of uh, in the field of radiation. Granuloma formation at the catheter tip could be as high as 8% as seen in other studies. And the drugs which could be prone of having the most common would be morphine, hydromorphone, sufentanyl, bupivacaine, and baclofen. To help detect a granuloma, MRI with or without contrast is used. CT myelogram or a dye injected at the catheter side port is used. Uh, some surgical complications regarding the procedure would be a PDPH in around 15% of the patient, uh, CSF hygroma or a pocket side seroma. Some rare cases would even need a surgical evacuation, uh, revision of the surgery. IDDS pump related complications could be many. There could be change uh, in the performance or failure of the catheter as a pinhole leak, a micro fracture, disconnection, breakage, migration, occlusion, and uh, unexpected battery uh, depletion, the motor failure or a port failure. So, what would you do in case of an IDDS failure? Initial evaluation and including the patient history will often identify the source. Verification of the pump content, the volume, and the pump setting is the critical initial step followed by a plain X-ray, that is a PN lateral view to visualize the entire catheter. The serial X-ray or a fluoroscopy to confirm that the pump roller is moving at the expected rate which was set initially. This is followed by an MRI study for a, and again a catheter access port aspiration. If required, then a nuclear medicine scan and a fluid collection assay has to be done. So the best practices guidelines which the authors gave for it was that intrathecal drug delivery system using an implantable pump should be strongly considered in patients with cancer-related pain that is not responding to or in patients who develop side effects from conventional medical treatment. This was a level one evidence. Trailing before, trialing before the intrathecal pump implantation for cancer pain should be at the discretion of the physician and patient. It is not a requirement at all. This was a level three evidence. Coming to spinal cord stimulation. So spinal cord stimulation is uh, indicated mostly for CRPS uh, pain, type 1 and type 2, post-laminectomy pain, uh, chronic radiculopathy, intractable neuropathic pain, and even visceral pain. 50% uh, of the patients who were exposed to uh, neurotoxic chemotherapy agents uh, in, during cancer pain developed CIPN, which is chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. Uh, with a median time of symptom development of, of around 71 days. So, SCS is said to be a viable treatment option for refractory CIP. The literature suggests regarding CIP, uh, CI, uh, 
SES for the treatment of cancer related pain is largely represented by case reports and small case studies, whereas there have not been any uh, trials. In the largest cohort, which was done till date by Shimoji et al., they published a retrospective review of 52 patients in uh, patients having carcinoma or sarcoma of the head or face, neck or upper extremities, trunk or the lower extremities. The authors reported that while the subjects obtained 80% 80, 80 pain relief initially, this decreased to around 20% pain relief at a duration of one year. So device selection, again, a screening MRI for the progression of the disease or evaluation of any new symptoms in such patients is done. 82 to 84% percent of the SCS implanted patients were expected to meet at least one MRI uh, within, the, within five years of the implant. So coming to the best practice statements, spinal cord stimulation is considered in patients with refractory cancer pain, grade two evidence. And uh, spinal cord stimulation may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for pain that is related to cancer treatment, such as chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. This was the level three evidence. Okay, so vertebral augmentation and radiofrequency ablation. So in 30 to 70% cancer pain patients, back pain can be there because of metastasized spinal tumor. And uh, this could be because of high vascularity with an entro uh, grade risk spread and a retrograde seating through the valveless batesin uh, venous flex. So it is considered in patients uh, with severe pain secondary to pathological vertebral compression fractures. And again, kyphoplasty has a lower risk of extravasation of hemat, uh, resulting in gre uh, greater kyphosis direction as compared to vertebroplasty. Applications of radiofrequency ablation in the osseous lesion was first described by Rosenthal et al. And the mechanism was destruction of the pain transmitting neuro neural tissue and the periosteal nociceptor. So the vertebral radiofrequency ablation with or without the cement augmentation allows for safe, effective, rapid pain reduction and enables quick initiation of adjuvant therapy. So there was a level one evidence that vertebral augmentation should be strongly considered for patients with symptomatic vertebral compression fractures from spine metastasis. Percutaneous RF ablation with or without cement is indicated in treatment of severe back pain from spinal tumors, but has proven to be safe and effective palliation therapy for painful spine metastasis. This was a level two evidence. Again, RF lesioning uh, used and most studied in the treatment of non-malignant pain only. The only RCT uh, which concluded was a superior efficacy of RF lesioning over steroid treatment when applied to the DRG in the patients experiencing axial thoracic pain from vertebral neck. The nerve blocks using corticosteroids targeting the glossopharyngeal nerve with tongue cancer pain patients is considered when the pain is refractory to conventional medical therapy. So there was a level one evidence for consideration of radiofrequency lesioning of the dorsal root ganglion in the treatment of axial thoracic back pain from vertebral malignant metastasis and level two evidence for cancer pain, which is unresponsive to medical management and the application of um, nerve blocks using corticosteroids or RF lesioning to a peripheral nerve can be considered in such patients. So coming to the surgical options in such patients, the surgical chordotomy interrupts the spinal thalamic tract, which has already been discussed in the previous paper, which was discussed. This was first described by Canpolat and uh, percutaneously, now it is uh, being used under CT guidance at the C1, C2 level. Chordotomy can be performed at the occiput and C1 for the lesion of the nucleus tractor to improve the head and neck related malignant pain. So this procedure is offered only to patients with a life expectancy of more than three months, which have no intracranial metastasis or suspicions of high ICP and an intact autonomic nervous system. And this procedure is said to have mild to transient complications that is the stevia, mirror pain, motor weakness, urinary retention, and taxia. It is performed with using an RFA between 60 degrees and 80 degrees for 60 seconds under sensory and motor monitoring. Surgical options, the other surgical options could be myelotomy and uh, which could be either open or percutaneous and uh, the recent one being used is under CT guidance. Again, there could be uh, the dorsal root entry zone lesioning, which is used for limited for upper limb pain, and uh, it is said to have provided a 80% pain relief. Then again, a stereotactic anterior single otomy, but uh, there are many of uh, many studies have not been uh, confirmatory. So, best practices guidelines that chordotomy should be considered for uncontrolled urinary artery nociceptive pain after failure of more conservative options. Myelotomy is used for infra diaphragmatic visceral pain 
and decreased opioid consumption. DREZ otomy is indicated for focal limb pain and pancos tumor. Singlotomy is indicated for late stage and uncontrolled pain, which is refractory to other therapies. Now, the latest which has come up is resinacera toxin, RTX. It is derived from a euphorbia resinacera plant, which is a potent TRP1 uh, agonist, which is expressed in A-delta and T-nerve fiber. So, it is said to uh, work as an axonal degeneration and leading to um, uh, effectively sparing the motor proprioceptive in the sensory cell body, which do not express the TRP1 and acts on the primary afferent spinal and DRT neurons. So the first study which was used, uh, which was studied in the human trials was still going on and the results are uh, having less pain and improved mobility, but it is under consideration. So the evidence is insufficient and it is under trial and efficacy and the efficacy is to be evaluated. So coming to the critical analysis. So these guidelines bridge the gap between conservative medical management, which was used and neuro ablative guidelines, which are cancer specific. This was the first article to provide a better practice, practices guidelines for interventional techniques in the setting of a very low quality uh, data that is a very limited high quality cancer specific studies in such patients. The guidelines conclude a patient specific approach to be followed and not a formal binding rules regarding the approach to a cancer pain patient. And again, a high quality studies addressing the intervention techniques need to be formulated and assessed for their efficacy and dependency for such patients. So the take home message from here would be that uh, interventional treatments provide excellent pain relief, have a low complication rate and minimize the opioid intake. And these guidelines would serve as a good tool to uh, bridge the gap between uh, man uh, conservative management and surgical management of such patients. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Akhil, for the extensive coverage uh, of the uh, paper. Now, uh, we also welcome uh, Dr. Sushma Bhatnagar, ma'am. She's joined us. So, uh, over to uh, the uh, faculties now, uh, Dr. Gedu, sir, Dr. Sushma, ma'am, uh, to conduct the questions, Q&A, and any comments uh, as well. I can't open my uh, video, Siddharth. Uh, then let me make you co-host and probably and can you try now? Yeah. Welcome, ma'am. So, uh, any any questions or comments or suggestions? Uh, also welcome from the participants and uh, over to you, faculties now. I think, Akhil, uh, whatever you have presented, and this is absolutely true that intervention, if we are, we will do intervention in cancer pain patients, it will definitely decrease the consumption of not only the opioids, but other medication. Only thing we need to have a very good like selection of patient that which patient needs which intervention. Uh, because most of the time, cancer pain patient, pain will be mixed type of pain, and it will be disseminated it will not most very rarely it is localized so when it is localized we should use the opportunity but it is not necessary if patient pain is not more than three or four places but one pain is very severe that time definitely uh, intervention helps and decreases the consumption of uh, opioids as far as intrathecal i have joined up uh, when once you started intrathecal we have uh, put intrathecal implant in almost 20 of our patients. And what have, we have realized that uh, it really works really well. And uh, out of 20, 18 patients, they really were, they were benefited so nicely. And one or two patients are still surviving. So they are, they are pain-free and they are disease-free, but they are living good life. Uh, spinal cord uh, uh, stimulator, Again, uh, it is it's, it's a wonderful tool. Only thing in all these, these are high cost equipment, high cost uh, procedures. And uh, we need to be, selection of patient has to be beautifully well. And uh, as you have said, the diagnostic block, uh, there was no uh, level three evidence, but I, I uh, recommend that always we should give a diagnostic or we should do a trial basically before giving intrathecal implant because ultimately we are using we are investing almost 5 lakhs rupees of a, per patient in, in implants itself it is always better to have a trial before uh, 
before starting this therapy so uh, although i don't know why level 3 evidence are there but definitely uh, it has level 1 evidence that we should it it is very very useful but trial should also be done before giving uh, before planning intrathecal therapy so uh, abhi i re- i really congratulate you all and siddharth that this was discussed intervention really is very very useful tool in cancer pain patients and we should know how to integrate intervention with pharmacological therapy and how to balance which patient will need only pharmacological therapy and which patient will need only intervention and where we can have a together we can use both the therapies and minimize the side effects and improve the quality of life Uh, thank you so much ma'am uh, get us any comments sir please yeah <clears throat> i want to say well i agree with sushma whatever she said it's correct but the thing is of course as i as she has rightly said there are couple of factors which are going to decide which intervention you are going to plan because the thing is it is one thing is cost factor second thing is the life expectancy of that cancer patient because if the cancer patient life expectancy is not good and he is already been prepared it i think intervention may not be very well tolerated by these patients also and plus more or if the patient has got some metastasis in the spine or vertebra or brain in such condition even any intra intervention that have been done around the vertebra it may cause more disaster so that has to be noted also very well otherwise whatever inter- intervention akhil has said are very good though he is going with the evidence base and whatever it is but then let me tell you as uh, said by sushma also that whenever intervention is been done timely basis the requirement of the opiates come down tremendously well so it definitely helps but i remember we had come a patient i mean quite often there are some locations where the patient come from because tata is a tertiary refer center where the patient used to come from the remotest place where forget opiate even sometimes nsaids are also not available so in such a condition if a patient has come with a pain in abdomen with a 7 8 9 pain score i will prefer to give the celiac plexus block instead of going for a trial because patient is not going to stay for a long time uh, over in the hospital because he's been already told that you are inoperable and all those things so in such condition i'll prefer to go for a uh, celiac plexus block so that his requirement of the opiates and all other pain medication will also be brought down tremendously and he can manage whatever his or her rest of the life pain free or at least with the least possible pain at the very remote place also so that is what interventions are definitely going to help that one one thing namrata what you said about the cordotomy and all again the survival how much time the patient is going to survive that will also be a deciding factor before we really go into the cordotomy and all well this is a trial that has been done but let me tell you in the good old books we have gone through the dorsal column stimulation then what you call uh, periaqueductal gray matter stimulations these are also be used in a terminally ill cancer patients also these were used in the good old days but then again you have to always make an mri and find out whether or pet scan to find out whether patient has got a vertebral mets and patient has got a advanced disease so this also has to be ruled out before we go into any vertebral or paravertebral intervention that has to be taken care of great so i think we have some questions which uh, which are there from the attendees uh, we will quickly take them and then we'll end this session uh, so uh, one of them is uh, from dr marco he is asking about the suggested suggested dosages for intrathecal local anesthetic and there is also a comment from dr uh, taruna panmacha so he she is asking uh, she is uh, commenting that uh, uh, in the uh, intrathecal pumps the trial may be in some cases optional in cancer pain especially if uh, you know the uh, the uh, the time which is left with the patient is uh, also limited to disease uh, decrease the disease burden also so that can uh, you know be one of the optional things and of course they can be substituted with uh, the uh, intrathecal injection which can give immediate uh, you know um, guidance in this regard 
So that's a point well taken, but um, it may not be a regular practice as uh, Sushma ma'am has mentioned. So uh, uh, in light of these uh, comments, uh, uh, Sushma ma'am, my question is to you. Uh, I'll direct this question to you. So what were the, uh, you know, the oral morphine doses or consumption of these patients before you put them to intrathecal pump? And the second part is uh, what dosages did you start them on and what is your experience? Because 20 is a good number, especially in Indian settings. And I think there are very few people who are doing this kind of numbers. So uh, uh, most of the patients were almost on 300 milligram of morphine every day. So 300 milligram of oral morphine is equivalent to one milligram for intrathecal morphine. So it is 300 times less. So uh, one of our patient was less than 300 because he was only 200, but he was having extensive side effects. And trial, uh, one, one participant or faculty has commented, trial is necessary, but trial is not at the cost of keeping patients pain free, pain in pain. We will, keep, we will not deprive patient for pain management, but simultaneously it is necessary that we should be very confident either by giving epidural that this therapy will work because, you know, most of the time cancer pain is so widely widespread that whether uh, we know that uh, this is in the lower part of the body and this in dermatome and this will definitely work, but it is always a good practice to have a trial. So uh, it decreases oral morphine almost 300 times by giving intrathecal morphine. So it really helps because imagine if a patient is taking 300 milligram morphine and having worse quality of life because morphine ultimately gives a lot of side effects. It is not that easy. So whatever we say, constipation, nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, this always remains. So if this patient will get only one milligram of morphine per day, I think this will really improves his quality of life. So we, I have my patient those who we have given intrathecal uh, pump with the one milligram of morphine. Two patients survived for four years, for few, for five years, and uh, those patients used to do a lot of their day, daily activities. Many patients, one patient was teacher, one patient was a bank employee, and uh, it's like they did very well. And one one lady was a housewife, and she was doing everything at home. She used to say that I'm doing chadu, pocha, everything. So imagine a patient with the intrathecal, uh, if she, she's pain-free. And you know, uh, if her chemotherapy keeps working, patient remains in a good quality of life if we make them pain-free for a, for a time when they, they, their disease is a little bit under control. So uh, it makes a huge difference. Only thing selection of patient is most important and selection, selection and good patient, right patient and their, their trial will help. That which patient will be benefited by this therapy, I think trial will help. Uh, Ma'am, one more thing. Uh, uh, did you use only morphine or ever you added uh, local anesthetics also to the mixture? Because if there's a mixed pain, like maybe a component of... Uh, nociceptive as well as uropathic as uh, one of the uh, uh, factors. Local anesthetic, uh, I have never added. I have added only clonidine in one of my patients, but it was giving a lot of side effects. So uh, we have changed the medication because that time uh, the pumper of that type that we could have changed, we, we can remove and we can change all the meds. So we have changed the medication. So most of the time we have used only uh, morphine with these patients. Great. Uh, great. So my last question, I think we'll take just one more question and then we'll end the session. So this, I think, uh, is to you, Dr. Gedu, sir. You must have seen a lot of uh, oral cavity, uh, you know, uh, patients. Uh, uh, so the question is from Dr. Varun Gupta. He's asking how to manage a CA tonsil or soft palate pain, which is not responding to conservative management. So any thoughts on this, sir? Well, if this... Uh... If in such a patient, conservative management is not working at all, that means even if you are given some pain medication at all, in such a condition, we can go for a nerve blocks also. But again, let me tell you, if I'm thinking of giving a glossopharyngeal or something like that, one has to be careful that because glossopharyngeal nerve, whenever we're going for an uh, extra oral approach, in such a condition, it is very closely associated with the vagus nerve, accessory nerve, and many vessels. So we are not supposed to give neurolytic because it can cause damage to the other nerve and it can really cause 
a problem as far as the aspiration will occur because the cord palsy will take place. So that's the reason in such a condition, what we do is we don't mind giving, uh, we have done it many times where we used to give a multiple types of times of block every four, third or fourth day, we call the patient again. So that once we give four or five blocks, they, our aim is to break the vicious cycle of pain and symptoms. So in such a condition, it definitely works. But as far as ma mandibular nerve block is concerned, we can give also. But again, giving it bilateral will also keep the patient's mouth continuously open only because patient's masseter will be gone. So again, in such a condition, we'll have to find out on which side the patient has got more pain, whether it's left or right. So whichever side it is, that side we can give a neurolytic block, whereas the other side we can just continue to continue to give the oral medications. Can I add Salsidhar in this? So, so again, uh, this type of pain, pain as Dr. Gildu said, that it is very, very challenging. So again, uh, your proper assessment of patient will help. Glossopharyngeal nerve block and glossopharyngeal peripheral uh, nerve uh, ablation will help this patient. But again, a combination of therapy will be required for such patient because again, head and neck cancer patient, we are we are thinking that glossopharyngeal nerve will help. But there there is a multiple uh, pain when patient is having advanced head and neck cancer. So a uh, combination of medication and plus your counseling and explanation that why why this, they are having so severe pain. This will, I mean, like your communication skills will work in all cancer patients with that how much you have explained and how beautifully you have explained. Once patient will understand the disease, their assessment and their expectation from doctor really be, becomes realistic. So it is very important to talk to the patient properly, communicate them, explain them the, why the pain is and how much you will be able to help. Because say telling patient that you will be all right, your pain will go 100%, I think patient will lose confidence on you. So 100% pain relief, many a times, 90% time, it is just not possible. So giving them realistic hope really makes a huge difference. <clears throat> Ma'am, uh, I needed to ask, uh, like uh, in this glossopharyngeal nerves, when the patients have associated nodes in the neck, is it advisable to go no, ahead with the... No, 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 no. no. Right. So that... When that, there uh, is a clear cut anatomy, when anatomy is absolutely clear, Whenever... and nowadays, nowadays uh, this uh, ultrasound really helps. Ultrasound guided, uh, we can... Uh, and when, when there is node and when the growth is there, we should not do. Not so true. that is very important in learning intervention when not to do intervention. Selecting yeah. your patient and when not to... Because... You should not, by over zealous approach, you should not harm your patient. It's very important. Anatomical landmark, whenever there is a distortion of the anatomical landmark, we are not going to yeah. do justice by giving such a block. Definitely not. So great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, Dr. Jain is asking one question. How do you procure preservative morphine, the free morphine for uh, intrathecal? Uh, uh, Dr. Jain, it is available with per pharmaceutical uh, uh, in these days, it is available uh, yes. preservative free morphine, and we use only preservative free morphine for intrathecal uh, implants. Correct. Great. So, uh, thank you uh, all of you for the interesting uh, uh, discussion. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Sushma, ma'am, Dr. Gedu, sir. You are the stalwarts, and uh, thank you so much for your time and efforts, and uh, you know, seeing the presentations individually and then mentoring uh, students. So, so kind of you. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. Wonderful, Akhil. It was good presentation. Thank you, Siddharth, and congratulations to both Thanks. Namrata, Siddharth. Thank you. Thank you. Very Mumbai nice to see you, school. Dr. Gadu, after a long time. <laughs> thank you. Same to you. Nice meeting okay. you always. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Good, good night, thank and you. thanks for making me a part of it, Siddharth. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. So, guys. Uh, uh, Bye, thank... Namrata. Bye-bye, sir. Thank you. So thank you for thank joining you. me for this interesting uh, discussion. Uh, as we know, this is the season two and we are focusing on the cancer pain and chronic uh, abdominal uh, pain. Uh, so we have some new things here. Uh, in this season, we are focusing at uh, a new time, uh, which is 9.30 p.m. Uh, on demand. Uh, so we have grouped the topics for your seasons. Uh, we have two faculties, two papers. We discuss paper in advance as well. Uh, uh, so the next uh, two papers I'll just be putting up as mailers. 
so join our mailing list guys because that's where i put in the uh, you know uh, the papers first so join our mailing list uh, the link is mumbaipainschool.net slash news uh, i have posted it in the chat box uh, join our whatsapp group again i have posted this suggestions comments are all welcome uh, just mail me on mumbaipainschool at gmail.com and uh, please uh, uh, join us for the hands-on MIPSIS, which is uh, our uh, fourth hands-on uh, workshop within a short span of uh, say eight or nine months and we will be conducting this uh, from 16 to 18 september uh, the bookings will open very soon so before the seats run out uh, please make sure we have very limited seats guys so uh, again i will not uh, take much of time uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, all the attendees and participants uh, see you uh, next friday 9 30 pm same time and wishing you all a very Happy learning. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.